Today's stuff we're going to be learning is Beitza Daf Kaf. Um, this month of learning, this upcoming month, is dedicated for Fuash Lema, for Noam Eliezer Ben Yael Chaya Ve'etan Yoshua. Um, and today's stuff is sponsored by Danielle Barta in memory of Michelle Damon Wasserman, Gitto Frida Batsara, whose your site is tomorrow. Michelle was taken from us too early, 15 years ago, leaving behind two little girls who have grown into beautiful young women who would no doubt make her very proud. Michelle, you will always be my inspiration to be my best, both in my Avodat Hashem and my Ben Adam Chavero. I miss you and think about you every day. Okay, we are going to get started from the bottom of Yud Tet Amubet, just to do a quick review. We started from the Mishnah. The Mishnah had this debate between Beit Shammai and Beit Hillel about, let's just read again from Yud Tet Amud Aleph. Beit Shammai Omrim, Mivi'in Shlamim Be'en Somchem Alehem. You can bring Korbanot Shlamim, peace offerings, but you can't on the holiday, but you can't do smicha of a low olot. Right, where you, afterwards, the Gemara says, right, Ula says this whole machloket is about, it didn't say what kind of shlamim, what kind of alot. He said, we must be talking about the obligatory offerings, right? So there's two obligatory offerings on the Chag. There's olot re'iyah. And this is in addition to all the musaf offerings and everything else. But then in addition, there's what's called olot re'iyah, which is supposed to be brought on the holiday from re'iyah to see. We're supposed to see the face of God three times a year. So when we go to the temple, we bring these korbanot ola, which again, the ola gets all burnt. That's what they're called, burnt offering. And we bring shalmei chagiga, which are obligatory shlamim offerings that we're supposed to bring on the holiday. Okay? That's to be differentiated. We're going to see today from shalmei nedava. There's also what we call shalmei simcha. So we ended yesterday where we talked about Chagiga and Simcha. Shalmei Simcha, okay, I want it to be clear. There's two different kinds of peace offerings people will bring on the holiday. One is Shalmei Chagiga, which are obligatory. One is Shalmei Simcha, which just means that in order to fulfill the happy, the mitzvah, to be happy and yantif, we eat, we eat meat, right? Generally, it's meat. Obviously, nowadays, there's people, vegetarians, even in those days, right? There's other ways to fulfill the mitzvah. But the main mitzvah is always talked about is eating meat. And therefore, they would bring extra shlamim sacrifices, which are which would be eaten by the owners, and they would bring those on the holiday. So here we write, uh, what Ula says is, we're talking about shame chagiga for smicha and ola re'iya, can you sacrifice them? So again, Beit Shammai says, you can bring the shlamim, but you can't do smicha. But you, and he says, you can't bring ola. Why? Because shlamim can be eaten. Therefore it's ochal nefesh, but not korbanot ola, which don't get eaten. To which Beit Hillel says, no, you can bring shlamim, you can bring olot, and you can do smicha. Okay, we saw some disagreements, some disagreements between them. There was this whole major debate, and we're going to get back to it again today, which we then proved it's a Tanaitic debate about whether they, their argument is talking about also nidarim and nidavot, and Beit Hillel would permit any voluntary offerings, or is it only, as Ula said, obligatory offerings? And even Beit Hillel would agree that when it comes to voluntary offerings, you can't bring them. So that was what we saw as a Tanaitic debate. And then to prove it, we brought one Braita that kind of held like Ula versus what we saw before that not like Ula. And then we brought another Braita that had three Tanaitic opinions. The last of them was Rabbi Shimon ben Alazar. And the last line we dealt with yesterday had to do with that. So let's go back to there. The last line of Rabbi Shimon ben Alazar. And again, through that Machloket, we got into a three-way debate about another topic, which is about Nidarim and Nidavot, that when you bring them, what's the latest date you can bring them? Is it that you get a cycle of three regalim? Is that, right, no matter whenever you start it, as long as, right, you get, you have up to the next three regalim. Some people said it's, you only have Sukkot is the only one. That was that last opinion, which was weird. And the other one said, no, 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 it's a cycle of regalim, but starting from Pesa. That's the most lenient, theoretically, because you couldn't, right, you would, need, you could end up need, right? It could be even a whole more than a year that you get to bring your sacrifice. So one of the things Rabbi Shem Ben-Lazar said at the end is, the topic of that mission was a Thanksgiving offering. When you bring a, it's a voluntary offering. You say, right, I want to thank God for something. I bring a Thanksgiving offering, it comes over with breads and, and other things. Anyway, it says you can, an animal obviously, because it's a sacrifice says you can use that same Toda offering, this is the Thanksgiving offering, to fulfill your mitzvah of Shalmei Simcha, which is not an obligation anyway, right? It's just to bring extra meat on the holiday. This can be thought of as part of it. 
but not for your Shalmei Chagiga, not for the obligatory offerings, to which the Gemara had said, isn't that obvious? It's a Dabar Shebechova. Any Dabar Shebechova doesn't end by element of If you have to bring an obligatory sacrifice, you can't take something that was already sanctified. So if I already sanctified my animal, before I came to the temple, I said, this is going to be my Thanksgiving offering. I can't use an animal that's already been designated for and is sanctified for an obligatory offering, because an obligatory offering always has to come from an animal that wasn't yet sanctified, and I say, I want to sanctify it. So the Gemara says, Lo afagav de at the bottom of your a bit. Even if I stipulated from the beginning, when I designated my animal, I said, I'm designating this animal for my Thanksgiving offering, and I'm going to use it also at the same time for my Chagiga. That doesn't work. How do we know it doesn't work? Well, we're going to see that it's exactly a question that Rish Lakish asked Rabbi Yochanan, and Rabbi Yochanan said it doesn't work. Rabbi Shema ben Lakish, Rabbi Yochanan, as he asked him, if somebody says, this is our case, I'm accepting upon myself to bring a toda, and whatever I bring for my toda, I'm going to use for my chagiga. Or I say, Hareni Nazir, I'm going to take upon myself Nazirut to be a, a, Nazir, a Nazirite. And that means one of the things that happens is after you become a Nazir and you can't drink wine and you can't do all sorts of things, or you can't cut your hair, at the end, you shave off all your hair. A galach. Now, when it says a galach, it's talking about shaving the hair, but it's really talking about you shave the hair and with that, you bring three sacrifices. So when it says agaleach here, which means to shave, what he really means is agaleach, and I will bring my sacrifices, mima ot maser sheni, from money that was already designated as maser sheni money, which anyway had to be brought to Jerusalem and was anyway sanctified. If you do that, mahu, right? It's the exact same situation. You're taking something that's an obligation, but you're saying I'm going to combine it with something else that's already sanctified. So amarle, nadu ve'eno yotze, nazir ve'eno magaleach. The first part of what you say is valid. In other words, you said, I'm going to be a Nazi. You said, I'm going to bring a Thanksgiving offering. You're obligated. You've done it. However, the second part of what you said is not relevant. You don't use your master shaming money to buy your korbanot. And you, right, you can't. And you can't fulfill your obligation of the korban chagiga from this money, from the, from the korban totem. Can't be done. So now they're going to bring in another example. And from here, we're going to get into exactly why this doesn't work. Somebody, Rashi explains, this was someone on their deathbed. Okay, Someone's on their deathbed and they say to the people surrounding him, go give 400 zuzim to so-and-so. And he should marry my daughter. Sounds like what? Give him 400 zuz in order that he marry my daughter, right? Sounds like a condition. I'm a rough papa. The guy is entitled to the 400 zoos. But he doesn't necessarily have to marry the guy's daughter, right? The guy gets off pretty, pretty good, right? He gets the money, not necessarily with any sort of obligation to marry the woman. Tama, so now they say, well, we're going to infer something here. The reason is, look at the order. He said, Give him the money and then marry my daughter. But if he said, marry my daughter, and then I will give you 400 zoos, if he married her, then he would get the money. If he didn't, he wouldn't. This seems to indicate that the issue here is the order in which you say it. And there's a big debate among the commentaries. What's the issue here? Why is the order important? So Rashi says, if we look back at the first one, Nazir ve'enomagalach, he says in the third, fourth line of Rashi, the kevan de amar hare alai nitchayev. As soon as he says the words hare alai, right, I'm going to be a nazir or I'm going to bring a korban toda, he immediately becomes obligated. De amira le gavoa ke misira le hedio. Normally, when you give something to someone else, you do a transaction, there has to be some sort of what we call a kinyan. Okay, there has to be some sort of buying, acquiring, done. An act like picking up a handkerchief or passing it. Okay, by passing the item, you've already given them ownership rights. Here, when it comes to korbanot, they say just saying the words, I'm giving this as a sacrifice, is as if you did a kinyan. First of all, you can't really do a kinyan with God, right? It's as if you already gave it to God. That means that by the first words of what you said, hare alai toda, and then you say, it's too late. You've already taken upon yourself the obligation, okay? 
You can't then add something else onto it because you've already done an, a complete action by saying those words. So likewise with the person who's sitting, or it's as if you've already, it's the same thing. When you're on your deathbed, anything you say, it's as if you did a Kenyan on it, an act of acquisition. So as soon as he says, I'm giving you 400 zoos, before he even finishes the end of the sentence, it's already as if it's a done deal. And then whatever he says after is almost irrelevant. This is similar to we've seen in some places where, or maybe I don't know if we've seen it this cycle yet, but we're going to see it in the Gemara. Talks about tfos, I'm sure we've seen it actually. Tfos lashon rishon. We go by what you at first say. Because as soon as it comes out of your mouth, it's already like a complete statement. If you say something after, it's, it's almost too late. And then if you say the reverse though, I will give you my daughter to marry if, right? I'll, you can marry, you should marry, right? You're, or you'll marry my daughter and I'll give you the money. Then it's dependent, okay? That's one way of reading it. Another way of reading it is um, what about if you, um, it, it's the issue that when we use, how do laws of conditions work? And this, we'll get to it when we talk about conditions. And many of us learn from B'nai Reuven and God and Chassi Shev and Menashe when they made this condition with Moshe. It has to be said in a particular way. It's like an if then. If you do this, then you do that. And this isn't if then. This is do this, right? so that. That's not the same thing. That's not a proper condition. And therefore, maybe it's not valid for that reason. Okay, I see you're asking a question. I think, Becky, you asked about the, um, what if you switch the order in the Chagiga? It's not so clear from the Gemara. I, I have to imagine that it wouldn't work either because that's the whole thing here, but it's not exactly clear. Okay, so at least it wasn't 100% clear to me. I didn't look up the commentary, said it, but I also had that question in my head and it's not so clear to me. Um, okay, now let's move on. So this basically, we brought this to say that, again, what Rabbi Lazar, Rabbi Shimon was saying is you can't use this for a Chagiga, even if you stipulated from the beginning. Okay, again, what the beginning means, does it mean how you stipulate, does it matter? Or is it no matter what, you can't. To which we brought this question, which Lakish asked Rabbi Yochanan about it, to prove it. So now, Yatim Meremar, the Ka'amar lahashmata mishmei denafshim. Meremar sat and taught this exact same thing in his own words, meaning he didn't quote it from Rabbi Yochanan and Rish Lakish. He said, I say this. So Ravina says to him, you teach it this way. But I learned that Rabbi Yochanan said this to Rish Lakish when Rish Lakish asked him. In other words, this is no, there's no difference in the content. It's just a matter of who said it. Ramar was sitting there saying it, and Ravina said, you know, I have a Masoret that this was come, came before you. The people asked the same question and answered it, and it was Rabbi Yochanan and Rish Lakish. Now we're going to go back, as I promised, back to this issue of smicha. Now we didn't really discuss what's the machloket about smicha, and we're going to see that there's a debate. We'll only get here in a while, but there's a debate about why Beit Shammai thinks you can't do smicha. I'll tell you, it's a little bit complicated, the first part, so I'll give you some information that's helpful that will help from before, which is, at the beginning of this sugya, we're going to assume a certain assumption, which is Beit Shammai don't allow shlamim, right? Remember, we're talking about obligatory shlamim, the ones, the shalmei chagiga. Obligatory shlamim, he does not allow you to do smicha on Yom Tov for them, right? Now, what's the reason? So we don't know the reason. But the assumption of the first part of the sugya is the reason is because you're not obligated in smicha for shlamim that are obligatory. Therefore, it doesn't override yantif, right? It's optional, let's say. So if it's optional, we're not going to say it overrides yantif. Whereas Beit Hillel is going to say they're obligatory. Now, you need even more background for this, which is where does it talk about smicha in the Torah? It only talks about it by voluntary offerings. It mentions it first by the Korban Ola in the very beginning of Sefer Vayikra. It says, Samachet Yadol Rosha Ola. You put your hands on the animal. And then it also says it by Shlamim, also in Nidava, only mentioned in voluntary offerings. Okay, now, Gita, you ask what's the potential Isser in Smicha? So we talked about this yesterday. The problem with Smicha is that you're using an animal. Because you put a lot of force on the animal, it's considered using an animal. And you're not allowed to use an animal on Yantif, right? If we allow you to use it that way, you might think you could use it to ride on it and you can't do that. So you, it's using the animal. Using an animal is a problem. Okay, so now. The So again, there's an assumption that what's known, and again, if you get this straight in your head, it'll be easier further down. 
in the sugi. There's a, right, so it's a good question, Gita, that you're asking. To use animals is only Durabanan and there's no shvut in the mikdash. So first of all, we don't override every single shvut in the mikdash. And that's why also we're going to see what, remember, Beit Hillel says it's okay to do smicha. And it seems to be based on that there's some other reason underlying here, which is smicha is not even a, a, obligatory. If it's not obligatory, well, then of course you wouldn't do it on Yantiv, even if let's say it's only Durabanan and shvut and Durabanan are allowed. But if it's not an obligation, then shouldn't do it. See, there's a second reason. So it's a combination of factors. It's not just one clear reason. And that's why Beit Hillel actually permits it, right? They don't have a problem with this at all because it's not, they don't see it a problem of using the animal. So now we get to, um, so again, remember that the, the, the voluntary offerings of the Ola and the Shlemim, it says in the Torah, you need smicha. Doesn't say by the obligatory Ola and by the obligatory Shlemim, not explicitly. Okay, so now we're going to start with a brayta. Tane tana kamei de Rabbi Yitzchak bar Abba. Certain student brings a brayta in front of Rabbi Yitzchak bar Abba. Right, we're constantly seeing this. Someone brings a brayta, and then Rabbi Yitzchak's going to respond, say something doesn't jive with your brayta. So the pasuk says, "Vayakrev et haolav yaseh kamishpat." This is talking about Aharon in the eight days of the Miluim. If you remember, he brings. I think this is on day number eight. It says he brings the Ola. And he didn't know this is an obligatory offering. Remember, we already know by optional voluntary offerings that you do do smicha. That said it in Vayikra. Here it says he sacrificed the Ola, right? You have to bring the sacrifice. And he did it kamishpat, the way the laws state. What's this word for kamishpat, right? Obviously he did it the way the laws state. So what are they darshan here? Kamishpat olat nedava. Ah, it means they did it like the Olat Nedav. What does that teach you? Just like the voluntary Ola needs smicha, also this one needs smicha. And that's how we learn from this Drashan, the Pasuk. That's how we learn that Olot Chova need smicha. Hamarle, he says to him, Rav Yitzchak says to the student, What are you, what, you bring me a Braita that's a Beit Shammai Braita? How, why is this a Beit Shammai Bright, huh? Because Beit Shammai now, we were in the category of Ola, so don't get confused. Now we're moving to Shlomo. We're going to make a, a certain corollary between sh- what's true for Shlomo and will be true for Ola. The main thing you have to remember here is there's a special drasha to teach you Ola, obli- obligatory Olot are like optional Olot. If you would be able to learn one from the other. You wouldn't even need a drasha. That's the main thing. In the end, it's going to be the same conclusion, but he's going to say <clears throat> the fact that you needed a drasha and you wouldn't have known it otherwise must only be Beit Shammai. Why? Because Beit Shammai don't learn, and for here I made a chart about this, Beit Shammai don't learn Shalmei Chova from Shalmei Nedava. They don't learn. Now, how do we know this? When it comes to, remember, I told you, Shamei Nedava and Olo Nedava all need smicha. Beit Shammai in our Mishnah, remember, said, Shalmei Chova, the obligatory ones, you don't do smicha and yantif, why don't you do smicha and yantif? Seemingly because, again, as I said, the beginning of the sugi is going to understand why is it? Because you're not obligated. So therefore, Beit Shammai must not learn smicha on obligatory Shlom and peace offerings from optional peace offerings. If, now we have to make the connection, if they don't learn the, uh, the <clears throat> um, Shalmei Chova from Shalmei Nedava, then they also don't learn, don't learn Olot Chova from Olot Nedava. If they don't learn it, then you need a special drasha to teach you that. Okay, in other words, that's the whole idea here. If you have a drasha, it means you couldn't have learned it otherwise. Now that must be only Beit Shammai because Beit Shammai doesn't learn. When it comes to Shlamim world, he doesn't learn obli- obligatory ones from optional ones in terms of smicha. Therefore, he also doesn't learn it by, by the Ola ones, the burnt offerings. And therefore, you need a special drasha. But if you want to say Beit Hillel, well, okay, and this is an assumption Rabbi Yitzchak makes, Beit Hillel requires smicha in our Mishnah, right? It says you could do it even on Yantif. You could do it even on Yantif, right? By the Ola. Remember, he said also the Ola and the Shlamim, right? So he says, Kevandi, right? By the Shlamim, he also says it overrides. Yantif. Why does it override? Because you must be obligated. How do you know that Shlamim are obligated? There's no special drasha. Ah, it must be because we just obviously learned Shalmei, obligatory Shlamim, from optional Shlamim. 
So comes the Gemara and says, Rabbi Yitzchak, he says, Kevan de Gamar Shalmei Chova Mishalmei Nidava. Since in the Shlamim world, he learns obligatory from optional ones for the laws of smicha, Olat Chova Nami Loti Baika, de Gamar Me Olat Nidava. Then you shouldn't need a pasuk for the Olat Nidava. Noted, what he's trying to say is there's also something asymmetrical here. There's no pasuk that teaches you shlamim, you need smicha for the option for the obligatory ones, even though it's only mentioned in the Torah by the by the optional ones. Therefore, it must be Beit Hillel just learn it one from the other, as in, well, obviously, if you need it for the optional ones, you're also going to need it for the obligatory ones, and done with done with it. You don't need any special drasha. So Rabbi Yitzchak basically says to him. The fact that you have a drasha here, that's only Beit Shammai, Beit Hillel would not require this. To which the Gemara questions and says, why are you so clear on this? Why are you assuming that? Okay, the question is, where does Beit Hillel learn? Why is Shammai Chova so obvious to him that you're going to need smicha for it? So now they say, Right, your whole assumption of your question, Rabbi Yitzhak, was that when it comes to the Shlomim world, we're going to learn, uh, we're going to learn obligatory from optional. Therefore, when it comes to the Ola world, we should learn obligatory from optional and no need for a drash. Why do you assume Shlomim we learned obligatory from optional? Maybe Dilma may Ola Tchova Gamle, Fola Tchova Gufa Bayakra. Maybe it worked in a different way. Maybe you learned. First, right, okay, again, our basic is both optional ones require smicha. Then comes the drasha and says, well, when it comes to the ola, we have a drasha that tells us also for obligatory ones, you're going to have, um, you're going to have smicha. Therefore, once we included olat chova, we can learn from olat chova to shalmei chova. And then the bride will work perfectly according to Beit because you still need the drasha. And once you have the drasha, you'll learn from there to shlamim. In other words, right, think about it this way. Shalmei chova has two aspects. One is it's a shlamim. One is it's an obligation. So either you're going to learn shlamim from shlamim, or you're going to learn obligation from obligation, right? So if you learn obligation from obligation, you'll learn it from ola, and then you would need the drasha, how you get to ola chova, that you get from a drasha. From there, you jump to ola shlamim. Um, sorry, shalmei chova, the obligatory shlamim. So that's the question on Rabbi Yitzchak, to which the Gemara counter questions and says, wait, what would be the logic to say that we're going to learn oblig obligation from obligation and not shlamim from shlamim? Must be, right? Because they assume it would be better to learn shlamim from shlamim. So why the Gemara just suggests that maybe not? If you take Shlamim that are optional, and you want to learn from there to shlamim that are obligatory, you can't necessarily do that. Why? Shlamim that are optional happen all the time. Shlamim that are obligatory, there's very few shlamim that are obligatory. They're only shamei chagiga, which are only in the holidays. So they're not very common. So you might think, don't learn something so uncommon from something that's so common. But then, if that's your logic, why you wanted to say, let's learn obligation from obligation and not shlamim from shlamim. Then we could say, but you can't learn obligation of shlamim from obligation of ola because we always talk about this. Ola is hugely different from everything else. Logamer shekain kalil because the ola gets entirely burnt. So now we're saying your logic to say let's learn it from ola is also somewhat difficult. So in the end, the Gemara says, "Atemi benaya," and this really answers Rabbi Yitzchak's question: Why do you need the verse to teach it from the ola? Even though theoretically Beit Hillel, we assume learn shlamim from shl right chova from, from um, obligation from from optional, and therefore should also learn the same from ola, because really it comes the shlamei chova are really learned right. We kind of set it up that it could be learned shlamim from shlamim right optional from obligatory uh, obligatory from optional, or it could be learned obligatory from obligatory from the ola. Well, each one has a weakness. Whenever we want to say something is what we call a binyan av, this creates a paradigm for all other things that are like it. You can't necessarily say we're going to learn shlamim from shlamim because that shlamim is different. This shlamim is much less common. So you might not learn from a super common case. And the ola is all gets burned. So you might not learn from there, even though they're both obligatory. But the combination of the two, 
since you're going to have smicha in the shalmei um, nidava, right? The, the optional ones. And since you're going to have smicha in the olat chova, in the obligatory ola ones, and each one has a stringency the other one doesn't have, from the combination, we're going to learn the two. And therefore, you actually do need the drasha, even according to Beit Hillel, because it's not obvious what Rabbi Yitzchak said, that we can learn shlamim from shlamim and then ola from ola. Okay, and there we get to answer his question. But now we're going to have a more basic question on Rabbi, uh, Rabbi Yitzchak's question. His whole thing, again, was based on this premise that smicha in our Mishnah is not something that overrides Yantif for Beit Shammai and is for Beit Hillel because Beit Shammai holds smicha is obligatory, I'm sorry, is optional, and Beit Hillel holds smicha is obligatory. If it's obligatory, it's going to override Yantif. If it's not obligatory, it's not going to override Yantif. That was his whole assumption. So now they say, the Savre Beit Shammai Shomei Chovalo Bay Smicha, right? That was Rabbi Yitzchak's assumption when he asked the question on the, the person who brought this bright. So he says, but, but Beit Shammai hold that you don't need Smicha. It's not an, it's not an obligation, Smicha, in Shalmei Chagiga. Vahatanya, doesn't it say in a bright? Amar Rabbi Yossi. Now we're going to have a whole different version of our Mishnah. Lo nechliku Beit Shammai Ubeit Hillel ala Smicha atzma shetzarich. There are, Argument has nothing to do with whether or not you have to do smicha. They all agree you have to do smicha. Shebet Shammai omre, uh, sorry, a smicha atzma shetzarik. They all agree you need amanech leku al techef lesmicha shchita. If you remember, we talked about this yesterday. What did we say? Beit Shammai will say, do the smicha before yantis. So the first assumption of the sugya was, Rabbi Yitzchak's assumption was, the reason why you have to do it before yantis is because it's not obligatory. If it's not obligatory, then we don't allow it, right? We don't allow it on Yantin, but do it before. It's optional, but you know, do it before. Now they say, no, no, no. The whole question is, when it comes to smicha, do we say, techev le smicha shrita? Okay, the Pasuk by smicha says, samach yado v'shachat. Okay, you put your hands on the animal and then you slaughter it. So some people darsh, and that means because they're right next to each other in the verse, that means you have to do it immediately before slaughtering it. Now, if you have to do it immediately before slaughtering it, you can't do it yesterday, Right? You can't do it Arab Yantif, you're slaughtering the animal on Yantif. So you'd have to do it just before. So that's the debate between them. Shabbat Shammai and Beit Shammai don't hold by that law. They don't think you have to do smicha just before you slaughter the animal. In which case they say, do it the day before, right? Better. And this goes back to using animals, right? It's true, maybe you could get away with using animals on Yantif. However, better to do it the day before if you can. Ubed Hill and Wim Sarich, Beit Hill said no. You have to do the smicha right before the shechita. So if the shechita is happening on Yadav, of course, the smicha is going to happen on Yadav. And that's why smicha varats. But according to this reading, they both agree that you need smicha for the korbanot. It's for sure an, ob- an obligation. So how could Rabbi Yitzchak and Amora say something that goes explicitly against the way Rabbi Yossi, who's a Tana, explained our Mishnah? So very easily, who da amar ki Tana? Oh. He holds like a different Tana. There was a tana edic debate about how to understand the machloka between Beit Shammai and Beit Hillel. Now we're going to read a different Rabbi Yossi. Titania, I'm a Rabbi Yossi, but Rabbi Yehuda. This is going to be the exact reverse. They all agree that when you need smicha, it has to happen right before the shechita. What's the debate? The whole debate here, though, is do you actually even need smicha? say, you don't need smicha. Why? Because the Torah never said so, right? The Torah only said it in voluntary offerings, never said it in obligatory offerings. So maybe you don't actually need smicha. And Beit Hillel says, no, you need smicha. Once you need smicha, well, then the smicha has to be right next to the shechita. Even Beit Shammai would agree with that in a case where you are actually obligated. And then we end up with this machlokat about whether you need whether the debate between them, again, this goes back to why don't Beit, Beit Shammai allow smicha, is on Yantif, is it because they think it's actually not an obligation and therefore it's not going to override Yantif? Or is it because they think that the smicha doesn't have to be done right near the shechita and anything you can do before Yantif, better to do before Yantif? Okay, Tanu Now we're going to see some interesting stories. Okay, we're going to get a little um, sneak pre, you know, like a, 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 an eye view into things that went on in the temple, some interesting ma'asim um, shahayu. There was a ma'aseh with Hillel. 
Okay, now Hillel is the one, right? We saw Beit Hillel, Beit Shammai. This is Hillel, as I can, the one who the opinion comes from. Shehevi olatola azara lesmochal abiyot, right? He held number one, you could bring olot, right? Remember, Beit Shammai says you can't bring olot. You can only bring shlamim because you can eat them and it's ochal nefesh. But sacrifices that you can't eat, even if it's an obligation of the holiday, like the olat riyah, don't bring on yantif, bring them on cholamot. So Hillel Azakim brought his korban Ola, according to his opinion, and he went to do smichan. Chavru alav tamidei shamay azakim. Okay, you, you can imagine like these thugs coming, right? The, 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 group, the groupies of Beit Shammai, they come to him, right? The students of Shammai Azakim, they all start ganging up on him and they say to him very, uh, you know, what it was, I can't think of the word, but a little almost deceptively. Amrulo, mati mazo. What kind of animal is that? You know, by the way, what are you sacrificing today? So now what was he doing? He was doing a korban ola. Korban ola, you have to remember, only comes from male animals. So what does he say to them? Amar lahem nikevahi. He lies to them. He doesn't want a big showdown in the middle of the temple, which you can imagine why, right? You don't want to get into a whole fight. So he says to them to avoid fighting, all right, good question whether this is allowed or not to lie, but he lies. He says, Nike oh, it's a female animal, which then means he's obviously not bringing it as an Ola, even though he is, but he lies and he says, female animal. Oh, and I brought it as a Shlamim, which Bechamai has no problem with. Kishkesh lahem biznava. He wags the, the, the animal's tail, like he moves it around so that they don't look underneath the animal to see, is it male or female? Okay, because it would be obvious, obviously. And he manages to, you know, get them off his case and they don't actually start checking to see if he was lying or not. End of story. But not really. Because what do you see in this story? It became clear that Beit Hillel capitulated or Hillel himself capitulated to Shammai's opinion because he didn't get up there and say, I hold that you could do a Korban Ola. So therefore, what happened? right? The Beit Shammai guys walked out feeling success, even though he lied to them. It almost didn't matter because he basically showed, I agree with you. So what they do, they tried to use this as, an, as a way to say the halacha is like us. Because look, even, even Hillel himself agreed with us. But there was one guy who torpedoed the whole thing. And interestingly, he was a student of Beit Shammai. Even though he was Shammai's student, he knew that the halacha was like Beit Hillel. He went to bring all the best sheep in the land, in, in Jerusalem, and he brought them into the temple. And he said in big, loud you know, announcement, He basically says, anyone who wants to do smicha on an animal, come right now. In other words, number one, right? Bring your olot riyah right now and do smicha on them, right? Both of which Beit Shammai did not agree with. And he basically made a whole big scene. What Hillel wasn't willing to do himself, he made a whole big scene. And on that day, they determined the halachas like Beit Hillel on this issue. Right, a bit of an exaggeration. I'm sure there were some people, but it was so established that nobody right? Disagreed at all with what happened. That was the first case. Now we get a story of a student of his. Now you'd have to assume this is already, right, that maybe there's a difference between Hillel and his student because Hillel was before they established the halachas like him. Already the student is doing it once they established halacha like Beit Hillel. So he brings his korban ola to do smicha. This time it's not a huge showdown. It's just one student of Beit Shammai. He says to him, Amarlo, mazo smicha. He says, what is this smicha? No, this, oh, how are you doing this on Yantif? Amarlo, mazo shika. He says to him very simply, what is silence? Meaning you should be quiet. <laughs> okay, you have no claim in this Beit HaMikdash because we clearly we side like me. Shitko benizifa bahalaklo, his his reprimand of him by saying it in those, right? You can see three small words can say a lot. By saying it that way, he quieted him down and the guy left and left him alone. So Amar Abai, Abai has this great line here. If you're a Tamil Chacham, you're a student of Torah, and somebody says to you something, like attacks you in some way, 
Don't answer him back in any more words than he used for you. And we learn this from this person. It's a great, it's a great line, right? What it says is when someone has a claim against you, don't answer them back with more words than they use for you, right? Sometimes you get into an argument and you start saying, oh, this, blah, 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 blah. And you keep trying to prove your point and trying to prove it. First of all, you're not going to get anywhere because usually the person has their mind made up and they're not going to be convinced by your argument. And it's almost like it's demeaning for you. If the person says X, they make their claim, you make your claim and move on. Don't get into a hole to do with them and don't say any more than them. It's only going to make you look bad, probably, is what they're trying to say. I mean, I'm sure you can come up with other reasons as to why you should do this. But, right, he said, he answered, right, with that, the story ends. And you should learn from that when you get into an argument with someone. Don't go, right? Usually when you, I know I, when I've been in arguments like this and you go on for a while, by the end, you just feel tired and drained and you haven't gotten anywhere and you almost feel like, why did I waste my breath doing that? And almost like, Maybe I said too much, right? Sometimes you say the wrong thing, even when there, someone pushes you into a corner. So anyway, this is a good life lesson. Tanya, now we're going to bring a bright. What is, often happens is that when we have a, a debate in the Mishnah, often there's a version in bright tote that is much more in depth that tells you, and often, by the way, it appears in the Tosefta, and this is actually in the Tosefta. It's a much longer version, which talks about not just what they said, but the arguments. Okay. It's, it's actually funny because we just said a minute ago, don't answer with too many more words. Here, we're going to have a back and forth where they each go into a long diatribe as to why they're correct and the other side is wrong. So we're going to see all their proofs and we're going to see two different versions. And in the end, I'll already tell you the punchline, which is we're going to say the difference between version one and version two is that one holds that Nidarim and Nidavot can be brought on Yantif according to Beit Hillel, and one holds they can't be. And that affects how they view the discussion between them, and you'll see why in a minute. So Tanya, right, which was a big debate that we had yesterday. We're going to see that same debate again today. So again, Beit Hillel wants to prove that you can bring the Korbanot, the Ola, Re'iya on Yantif. So he says, on a regular Shabbat, you can't cook food but you, and slaughter animals, but you can do it for sacrifices, right? Your korban tamid, your Shabbat sacrifices, all that gets done on, in the temple. Therefore, makom shemutar lahedyot. So when you're allowed to eat the meat, meaning you're allowed to slaughter animals on yantif, eno din shemutar So shouldn't we then allow ola re'iya sacrifices, right? Because if we can slaughter our own meat, of course, we should be able to slaughter voluntary offerings in the temple, right? Or well, not exactly voluntary, but ones that aren't 100% the obligation of that day, like the Ola Re'iya. Remember, those are obligatory, but you could do them the whole holiday. So to which Beit Shammai responds, what do you mean? You can't just do anything you want in the temple. I'm going to use Nidarim and Nidavot to disprove your, your Kavachomet. Shemutar lahedyop asur legavoah. You can cook any meat you want, but you can't go into the temple and bring voluntary offerings. Now, obviously this Tana, who's bringing this or whoever wrote this source, since Beit Shammai says to Beit Hillel, but Nidarim and Nidavot obviously can't be brought in Beit Hillel, doesn't disagree with that point. Obviously this Tana holds that Nidarim and Nidavot, even according to Beit Hillel, any voluntary offerings like that, vows and gift offerings cannot be brought in the temple. So that, so what did Beit Hillel say? I'll distinguish between Nidarim and Nidavot and Olat Riyah. There's a big difference. I'm willing to allow Olat Nidavot, but not Nidarim and Nidavot. Why? There's no time issue associated with it other than, you know, Balta Akhir, but, but you don't have to bring it. You can bring it any time of year. You don't have to bring it specifically today. Tomar Olat Riyah, Shekavu Olasman, but Olat Riyah are supposed to be brought on the holiday. So therefore, I'll let those override Yantif, whereas I won't allow Nidarim and Nidavot. What do you mean? Olot have a have a time associated with them. It says Ditnan, It says in the Mishnah, Mishalo Chag beYom Tov Arishon Shachag Chogeg VeHolech Kol Aregel Kulo VeYom Tov Acharon Shachag. If you didn't bring it the first day of the holiday, you could bring it the rest of the holiday. You could even bring it on the last day of the holiday. You could bring it right all week. So. They're not so set in time that it should override Yantif because you can bring it tomorrow. You can bring Cholomoe, right? Any day of Cholomoe. So you see from there that it doesn't have a time frame associated with it. 
Amrula and Betilel. Betilel says, what are you talking about? Of course they have a time frame associated with. Avzo, kavu alazman. No, it does have a time frame associated. It's true. It doesn't have to be brought today. But it says, avar harega v'lo chag, eno chayav b'achoryuto. If the regal passes and you didn't bring your korban chagiga, then you're not chayav in achrayut. Okay, we're not going to get into all that, what that is. But the point is, you've already missed your chance to do it. Okay, can't bring your korban. So what do you see here? You see, it is, t- it's, it's true. It's not just for today, but it is just for the week and that's it. And then you lose your option. So do it today, Anyant. So Beit Shammai is still not satisfied. The Pasuk, when it talks about Ochal Nefesh, says, This only can be done for you, meaning you can cook, right? Do things for food purposes for you. What is lachem? Lachem often means lachem below the gavoa for you and not for sacrifices. So don't say because you can, right? That these sacrifices, since ochal nefesh is allowed, we can allow sacrifices. Ochal nefesh is for you. Sacrifices are for God. The two don't mix. Amrulahem beitilel. Just say, what are you talking about? Haluk farnei mar laHashem. Call to laHashem. Remember, we have that drasha. He says vachagotem otochag laHashem. LaHashem means even sacrifices. All sacrifices can be brought for God, even. So then, what do you do with the lachem? Lachem, they use for something else, which you've seen already. Lachem, 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 sorry, I think this is in tomorrow's stuff. It's for you and not for dogs. It's for you and not for Gentiles, okay? Meaning, ochal nefesh is permitted for you and not to other people that aren't Jewish, not to dogs also. That means that, you can say lachem velo la Hashem, right? According to Beit Hillel, it includes you and God related things that you're going to do. And it excludes other things. Okay, that's the first discussion. The second discussion between them, the second version is He had a different version of the argument between Beit Shammai and Beit Hillel. His went like this. When your oven, okay, your kira was like um, burners. Your burners are closed, meaning Shabbat, you can't cook anything. Kirat rabcha p'tucha, but yet it's similar to the other one, but it's in a different language, right? And it's a language that includes a lot more, which is going to include Nidarim and Nidavot as well. Then, right, on Shabbat, when your oven, you know, your burners are closed, you can't use them, but you can use them in the temple, right? You can bring all the sacrifices are going, the fire is going there. So when everything's allowed, cooking-wise, wouldn't you think that God's Oven, right? His burner would be open, his, his bath, meaning you could bring everything. The chem bedin, and also it makes a lot of sense. Here's a great line. Imagine yet, you have a huge full table and the, and the temple has nothing going on because you've done your obligations for the day and you're finished, right? We'd rather fill it up with all of the people's olo riyah, right? That'll fill the, the mizbeach all day and then it won't look nebuch, right? That there's nothing there. So now they take a zoom out to the first Tana and Abba Shaul, and they say, what's the root of the Machloket? Sorry, the first opinion, which used Beit Shammai arguing with Beit Hillel and said, but don't you agree, Nidarim and Nidabo can't be sacrificed, and therefore that's an exception to your rule, and that disproves your point, to which Beit Hillel distinguished between Nidarim and Nidabo and Olat Riyah. That whole issue didn't come up in the second one because According to the second one, Beit Hillel allow everything, even the Darim and Devot, and therefore Beit Shammai couldn't make an argument using that claim because Abba Shaul obviously held that even the Darim and the Devot are permitted on Yantif, according to Beit Hillel. Amar Rafuna. L'divrei ha'omer ne Darim and Devot ain't kribim b'yomto. Now, the one who says you can't bring voluntary offerings on Yantif, lo tema, don't say mi da'oraita mechzechazi. According to the Torah, you can, but Rabbanan who degaz rebe, but the rabbis said no, because they didn't want you to push off your voluntary offerings to Yantif. But really, from the letter of the law, you could. Don't say that. But you can't even bring them on a Torah level. How do we know this? Because it says about the Shteh Alechem. Shteh Alechem are the breads that you bring with the sacrifice on Shavuot, the special sacrifice of the Kibseh Atzeret. It's a Chovat Hayom. You can only do it that day, meaning there's no concern oh, I'll push it off and I'll, I'll bring it on Shavuot. No, it, its obligation is that day. And yet, right, so therefore, Lekala Migzar Shema Yasha, you can't say, oh, we're worried people are going to push it off to the Yantif. 
ואין עוד אוכל, לא את השבת ולא את היום טוב, אבל הפקט הוא שאתה צריך להכניס את הבקט הזה לפני יונטף או לפני שבת. אתה לא יכול להכניס את הבקט על שבת או יונטף, אם יונטף נכון על שבת או אי פעם. אתה יודע, על שבת יונטף, אתה לא יכול להכניס את הבקט. You have to bake the bread before. So what do you see here? It must be de'oraita and not because maybe you'll push it off because there's no concern of maybe you'll push something from a regular day off to this because it's an obligation of yantif. And yet it's still forbidden. That shows that certain things that we forbid, we're going to forbid even on de'oraita level. Therefore, also here in the de'orim and the de'vot must be forbidden on a de'oraita level, on a Torah level, not to be brought. Last question for today. Ibayalu. Again, the divrei ha'omer, the darim and the devote and kriven b'yantif. Again, there's a machloket, but if you hold it, you can't bring voluntary offerings on yantif. Here's the good what if. Avar v'shachat mai. What if you did it anyway and you slaughtered the animal and then you find out I wasn't allowed to do that? What do you do with the blood? Do you sprinkle the blood or not? So we're going to have two answers. Both of them hold you sprinkle the blood, but for a different reason. And then we'll say what's the difference between the two and we'll finish with that. Rava amar zorek et adam amenat latir basar ba'achila. You can sprinkle the blood to permit the meat to be eaten because even though you shouldn't have done it, but you did it already and you can eat the meat. So eating the meat is a need for yantif. So therefore we allow you to sprinkle the blood on yantif in, in order to allow you to eat the meat since it's ochal nefesh. If we don't allow you to sprinkle the blood, you won't be able to burn the parts on the altar that are meant to be burnt. When you can't burn them on Yantif, we're going to burn them after Yantif because that can be done at night. But the sprinkling of the blood can't be done at night. So we're going to allow the sprinkling of the blood in the day in order to permit the burning of the parts of the meat at night. He doesn't talk about Ochel Nefesh at all. So therefore, the Gemara says, My Benayu. Ika Benayu, Nitma Basa O Shavad. If the meat became impure, meaning you can't eat it, or it got lost, meaning you can't eat it because it's not here. Le Reva, lo Zarek, Reva wouldn't allow you to sprinkle the blood because he'll, to pour the blood on the altar because he'll say, there's no point now. It's not Ochal Nefesh anymore because you can't eat the meat. But the Rabba Bar of Huna, you would still sp- sprinkle the blood because there's still a need to burn the rest of the meat on the altar. Okay, the Gemara is going to now start with the Meiti Bay. We're going to do this in tomorrow's stuff because it already starts here and continues on to the next page. They're going to question Rabba Bar of Huna's opinion. And you'll see that in tomorrow's staff. Have a Chag uh, Sameach, everybody. Hope you enjoy sitting in your sukkahs after all that we learned in Masechet Sukkah. And uh, tomorrow's year will be up in a little bit. Have a great day.